nice to be with you here today. I'm uh, rather excited today, so if you see me dancing around up here, it's not just because I had six bottles of water. <laughs> you know, somehow you think that if you drink more water, it'll keep your mouth from getting dry, but I don't know, do I need to do a headstand, or <laughs> how does that work? So today we're going to talk about the will of God, but before we go there, um, one of the things that I love about Pastor Ben it is, is that he's transparent. You know, when he's up here, he'll let you know if he's having a hard time, what kind of trial he's going through, what kind of struggle. He's the kind of guy that doesn't hide anything. And I was wondering, is that just up here or does he live it out? And I think we have a video that will prove to you that he actually lives it out, not just here. Can we show the video? because he's not here, so <laughs> he might have some words for me when he gets back. We're going to talk about the will of God. It's interesting, some of the sayings that people come up with about the will of God. If it's God's will, it's God's bill. We've all heard that one, right? That's to, to prove that God's the one that provides. He's our source of provision. But I can't help wonder what happens you could have a really hard lesson if you find out that it wasn't God's will and you're left holding the bill. And how about, you know, some of the more probably southern sayings? I'll be there Sunday, Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. I was wondering, does that go back all the way to when Moses entered the Red Sea? <laughs> I don't know. Some of these things are a little confusing. So I thought today we'd talk about the will of God and maybe it would help each one of us discover what his will is for our lives and, and how we can live it out. But before we start, Andy, would you come up and pray for us? I told you I might pick on you. Lord, we just praise you and thank you for this time. Thank you for this tremendous celebration during our praise and worship time. And Lord, as we wade into your word today, pray, Father, that you would come and walk amongst us and speak to us. Would you use the words that you've given to Rory to speak to our hearts this morning? And may nothing be stolen or taken or dropped to the ground, but be implanted into our spirits, Lord. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. So now we can be serious. You know, there's times in life when we feel like we're in line with God's will. That I've got it figured out. But then... Life has those things that pop up, whether it's a disease, whether it's a loss of a loved one. There's so many things that ch change our course of life. Things that we have to just realize in life, there's ups and downs and twists and turns, and somehow we have to continue to push forward. You know, when we were called as missionaries to Africa, Pam and myself, we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was God's will. That there was uh, words that God gave me six months before we got the call that lined up with the call. There was prophecy. There was confirming words. There was circumstances that just boom, boom, boom. Everything just lined up. 
And we knew that we knew that we were supposed to go. And it's a good thing we did, because my dream looked more like Tahiti, Hawaii, <laughs> not Central Africa. I was actually, you know. But <clears throat> here's something to think about. In life, God can take us places that we never wanted to go to. And he can keep us there till we never want to leave. Is that true? <clears throat> you see, for the last two years we were in Africa, we, had a, we were over an orphanage. There was some 87 people, staff, everything from bus drivers to teachers to house moms to mechanics to you name it. Had this big crew, 23-acre orphanage. We were building more huts to house kids. There was vocational schools. There was primary, secondary school. There was a couple of churches, another one being built. It was like a dream. We got to come back to the U.S. once every six months and visit churches and talk to people <coughs> Excuse me, about sponsoring children. See, because while we're out there, we got to go out in the bush in these four-wheel drive vehicles <clears throat> and you go to a little round hut with a thatched roof. There'd be 20 people trying to live there. They'd be shucking with like three pieces of maize, corn in the front yard. And it would be a, a grandmother or an aunt that had taken in kids who had lost their parents through war or disease. So like I said, this was like a, a dream to be able to take those kids, bring them into the orphanage. They had school uniforms, they had bedding, they had everything they needed. They had Mark and Kim come out every Christmas to create this huge Christmas party. They would bring teams out from their church. It was amazing. It was amazing, but all of a sudden, the dream came to an end. You see, because where we were staying was an area that was surrounded by swamps which means that malaria was quite prevalent. We got it once a month for two years. So after getting malaria 25, 26 times, Pam went to the clinic, and they finally said, I don't know what's going to kill you first, the medicine or the malaria. She also had typhoid and malaria at the same time once. So we, we, we had to ask ourselves, Lord, tell us, did you bring us here to die, or is there more for us? We came back to the U.S. rather quickly. I'm glad to report that now we're healthy, happy, and everything's going well. But when we first landed, we didn't know where we were going to live, didn't know where we were going to work. I'll tell you, it, it rocked our world. It definitely rocked our world. And how do we handle those situations? All we can do is continue to press in and trust God. Continue to trust that maybe that was his will for a season and he's got something else for us now. So what is God's will? What is God's will? I mean, we look through the Bible and you can see many things that we're supposed to do, many things that we're not supposed to do, not supposed to worship false idols. That's God's will. We're supposed to Love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and strength. We're supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves. But I thought today it would be good if we look at what's the overall plan of God. You know, if we really want to know where we fit in, it would be good to start with what is God's plan, what is God's will. Sometimes he speaks to us, we get a confirming word that, oh yeah, I'm right on track, but other times we don't know. Am I walking around in some gray area, not sure where I'm at? When we went to Africa, we knew, like I said, we knew that we knew that we knew we were supposed to go. But what happens when those seasons get short, when life throws you a curve, when it didn't turn out the way you thought it should turn out? 
So I want to talk about God's will, the implications of it, and how we can live it out. So if we look at the high level of God's will or God's plan, we are so blessed that in the New Testament that it's revealed to us. What was once a mystery is now revealed to us. I love the the first several verses in Ephesians. And I'm going to start in verse 5 of chapter 1. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of the glory of his grace. So God's will is for us to be reunited with him. That's his desire, to be reconciled, to be adopted as his children. And that is pleasing to God, the word says. It was always his plan. This wasn't plan B. This is what he had planned from the very beginning. Then if we jump to verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and are which are on earth, in him. So God revealed the mystery of his will in the New Testament. Through Jesus Christ coming to the earth, being fully obedient to God all the way to dying on the cross. He didn't say no. He went through it. The Bible tells us that all things will be under Christ's authority. That doesn't mean that all people will accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but all things will come together in Christ. So if we look at this high level of God's plan, or his purpose he has for us, we see reconciliation and adoption, and we see that he's going to gather all things together in Christ. So regardless of our age, regardless of our occupation, regardless of how much we know or how much we don't know, if we know that God wants to gather all things together in Christ, it's something we can use to measure our efforts. Regardless if you're a school driver, a a school teacher, a bus driver, whatever your role in life is, a student, You can look at how you spent the day. Did I do anything to help anyone get closer to Jesus? We know that not everyone will be reconciled to God, but we do also know that it's God's desire that they are. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So we know that not everybody's going to accept Christ, but we also know that it's God's will, it's God's desire, it's God's long-suffering to draw people to himself. In 2 Peter we read, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And in John, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that all of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son of God, or the Son, and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So we know that God's plan is to reunite us, gathering all things in Christ. But how do I, how does that affect me and how does that affect you? How does that change our lives? What's our place in his plan? So let's look at how we can take part in God's plan. Number one, we need to know that God's will is only available through, amen. God's will is only available through Jesus Christ. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He also said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. The only way for everlasting life is through Jesus. There's no other way. No other way. With that being said, we know that we are to love our neighbors, right? But what does that look like? I wonder, does that look like grandma? Just 
squeeze their little cheek and tell them, I love you to death. Or are we supposed to love them into eternal life? Are we taking a little bolder step? Of course, there's the, the timing. You want to build a relationship. But ultimately, we, wanna, we want our, uh, our plans or God's plan to be intentional in the way that it's used through us. <sighs> Number two, we want to be in relationship with God. Now, I know all this stuff you guys already know, but sooner or later I'm going to get to something and you're going to go, hmm. So, Jason, I'll be your part. When I get to that part, do it real loud, go, hmm. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Jesus said, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you'll be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. So to, be ab to abide in this case means to be united, means in Christ, to be connected, and to bear much fruit. Before there was genet genetically modified organisms, fruit used to be what would come off the tree that was meant to produce that fruit. You didn't go looking for watermelons on a grapevine, right? If you wanted watermelons, you went and found a watermelon vine. That fruit that we are to bear is the Holy Spirit in us and through us, right? It's not thorns and thistles. So how we act, how we present ourselves, our actions, our words, are how we bear fruit, how God works through us. And number three, we need to surrender. We need to remember that it's God's will and not my will. This is always a tough one, but we can't just do our own thing and expect God to bless it. We want to be involved in what God is doing. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. How is our mind renewed? By being in the Word, through prayer, through the Holy Spirit, through our faith, by being in the Word, through prayer, by being in the Word. Did I say by being in the Word? Oh, I didn't want to miss that because Andy's watching me. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said that. For those of you that haven't been in the word, wanted did you know that Jesus said that? Jesus was completely and fully obedient to God. He was in full submission to God. Number four, this will be a, a favorite one for many. Obey what you already know. Obey what you already know. There's a lot in here that we can say, is that God's will? Well, yes, it is. It's right here in the book. If you want to discover his will, it's important that we're obedient to what he has already revealed to us in the word. Here are just a few examples. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. In other words, that you're set apart, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion or lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. So some people would say, ah, oh, well, that's, that's old-fashioned, or that's too restrictive. But the reality is God put boundaries in place in our lives to protect us, he put boundaries in our lives because he loves us so much. He put boundaries in our lives 
that would keep us from going into some form of bondage. So, some passages we like to read a little more than others, you know, depending on whatever our circumstances are. Personally, I like this one. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. So when your teenager comes to you and says, Dad, I need the car and some money so I can go out tonight, you can say, Son, I love you, but I owe you nothing. (laughs) Try it. See if it works, okay? (laughs) Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Number five, pray, listen, and ask. If We want to get into God's will. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. In Colossians, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Jesus tells it we're us t- that we are to ask, that we're to seek, that we're to continue to knock. And as we, as we get into prayer more and more, he'll show us the right door to knock on. Sometimes I think we have a tendency to knock on the wrong door. Number six, we need to seek godly advisors. Where there is no counsel, the people fail. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So we have to evaluate, do we actually have someone in our life that we can share what's going on in our hearts? Not just a friend, but somebody that can give us godly advice, somebody that can help us walk through hard times, somebody that can help us with challenging questions. Do you have godly counselors in your life you can confide in? If not, we need to to find somebody. And this one kind of takes a little turn here, but Number seven is know who you are. Know who you are. As each one has received a gift, minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So God has created each one of us uniquely, right? We each have different gifts. We each have different life experiences. Sometimes those things that brought you the most pain can be the very thing that God can use to minister to someone else. Sometimes our our greatest victories, sometimes whatever it is that you've been through in life, raising children, we all have different gifts. We all have something to bring to the party. And then we also, not only our giftings, but what is your heart telling you? We go through different seasons. What, as you're in the word, as you're uh, praying, what are you hearing? What, what kind of words are jumping off the page that you know, wow, God is speaking to me? For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of yourselves more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. And so we, 
being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in ex exhortation or encouraging. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. And he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So we all have different gifts, yet we're not to think too highly of ourselves that, hey, uh, I've got this really cool gift and uh, you don't. <laughs> well, let's go to this next slide here. God's plan, how to take part. We should have another slide. I think you passed it. We want to go back one. No? Mm hmm. Do we have one with all seven bullet points on there? There you go. Thank you. So, as we look at all of these, that God's will is only available through Jesus, that we're to be in relationship with God, we're to surrender, it's God's will, not my will, that we're to obey what you already know, that we're to pray, listen, and ask. We're seek godly advisors. And then the last one kind of stands by itself, know who you are, right? Because that, that more ties into our individuality. But let me ask you this. I'm going to pick on the men today. What if we were to take Matthew... Guido and Andy and Trevor and Jason, Terry and Andy and Joe. What if we took all those guys together and 90% of the will of God for their lives was the same as 90% of the will of God for my life? When you look at the scope of all eternity, God's master plan, just maybe that last one there, know who you are, that, that might compromise 10% of God's will for us. Is that even possible? Let me tell you where I'm going with that. What, what I'm thinking about is that if we focus on that 90%, if we know number one, we're practicing number two, number three, number four, number five, and number six. That equates to about 90% of God's will in our life, his master plan, right? And then the missing pieces, where do we fit into that? I think that if we focus on all the things that we know, that God will reveal that last 10% to us that God will show us, show Trevor, here's what you're supposed to do today. That as we focus on that 90%, that he'll be there for us in ways that surprise us. That will open things up. Sometimes I think that we spend too much time thinking about the 10%, thinking about, what is God's will for me? I'm not going to do anything until I hear from God what to do. But we already know what to do. Andy's looking at me like I'm crazy, but... <laughs> he already knew that ahead of time. <laughs> see, as we, as we read on in Romans, we can see that most of this really pertains to all of us. If we go to Romans 12, verses 9 through 12, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to <coughs> one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, 
serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. These are all God's will that's universal for all of us. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. It is possible as much as it depends on you. Live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to the wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will... <clears throat> this one I have to be careful with. For in so doing, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. You see, that was Pam's mom's favorite part right there. It always made me a little nervous when they invited me over for a barbecue when we were dating. <laughs> do not overcome, <coughs> do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we're set apart. We're set apart. But if we really want to follow God's will, it takes a conscientious effort to not only know that you are set apart, but to grow in being set apart. If we really want his plan and his purpose for our individual lives, if we focus on what he's already revealed to us and really dig in, I believe that he'll give us the rest of the picture in his timing. But what can we do each day? There was a Pastor Jerry Cook up in Oregon that he met with a group of pastors and gave them all a clock that said, just do today well. Just do today well. Sometimes we don't have to worry about what's going to happen six months from now. Where am I going to be? What am I going to do? But what if I could just do today well? What if I could see something beyond my own agenda? I'm one of those task guys. So what I'm telling you isn't always that easy. Since school started back up, our daughter Abby is an athletic trainer. So like Sunday night, she'll say, oh, Dad, by the way, I have to be at school tomorrow at 6 a.m., which means we have to leave the house by 5.30. So if your routine is that you get up at 6, get a cup of coffee, sit down with your Bible and pray and journal, that kind of throws you off, and you, you have to find some other place to fit that in because it's important. But once you get rolling on your tasks, does it always happen? I'm afraid not. I am afraid not, huh? But what can I do this very day? What can I do to make sure, even if I didn't get to read my Bible at 6.05 like I wanted to, am I going to miss an opportunity if I'm at the grocery store and I feel like God's prompting me to talk to somebody? Am I going to say, oh, I'm too busy? I don't know if anybody else has busy lives. Probably not, huh? <laughs> but we can't let our schedules choke out our time with God. We need to know what he wants to teach me today. What, how does he want to work through me today? Each one of us, huh? So, okay, now that we've downloaded all this stuff on you, Here's the pop quiz question of the day. In the Bible, how many, get ready, this could be tough, how many perfect people do we talk about in the Bible? 
Yep. There was only one that went to the cross voluntarily. One that died for our sins so that we could have forgiveness. One that rose again that we could have eternal life. There were some others that seemed to do pretty good, like Enoch, right? What did he walk with God for 365 days or 365 years? Our time's a little shorter now. And he was taken up. But gosh, I don't know, when, when I read through here, I sure see an awful lot of imperfect people just like me. People with baggage. People with problems. People that create problems. People that mess up. But somehow God's will gets done. And it will continue to get done because it's God's will. It's not my will, not your will. So whether we get to see the the fruits of our labor or not, it's still God's will, God's plan. And we are just so blessed to take whatever small part of that that we can with our lives. Do you realize how amazing that is that, that we get to partner with God? Could you have a better boss to work for than God? Probably not, huh? Jason, can you come up? So this last verse is my prayer for you. May the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I have to tell you that there is certainly a difference between going to church and allowing Jesus to be your Lord and Savior in your life. I didn't grow up in a household that was Christian. When I met Pam when I was 20 years old and we got married when I was 22, we would explore, go to different churches. Pam had grown up Catholic. I wasn't all that excited about it. I was more interested on my day off to get up early, go down to the beach and go surfing. But finally, in God's patience at age 39, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And it was just a life changer. All of a sudden, instead of going to church on Christmas and Easter, We went on Sunday, went on Sunday night, went on Wednesday. I was like, wow, I'm way behind. I need to get into this and figure out what this is all about. Somebody asked me if I knew the books of the Bible. And, of course, oh, they said, can you name five books of the Bible? And, of course, no. But God is patience. God is long-suffering. So I would tell you today, If there's anyone here that's been going to church but hasn't really offered themselves up to Jesus as their Lord and Savior, today is the day. Today is the day. So if that's your need today, 
I'm going to pray for us in just a minute, and everybody's eyes will be closed, and nobody will know but me and God and you, which is the most important. But I feel that I would be wrong if I didn't, didn't offer that up to you. I'm just up here to agree with you. So let's pray. You could clo- bow your head and close your eyes. Father God, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. Lord, we know that you have a plan, not only a master plan, but you have a plan and a purpose for each one of our lives, Lord. We thank you for that. Help us to to fill that role that you've created just for each one of us, Father. Help us to transverse the seasons of life to do your will, Father. And with everyone's heads bowed and your eyes closed, if if you need to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you want to accept him into your heart, I'm just up here to agree with you. So if you could just slip up your hand. If you need to know Jesus, today is the day. God is patient and long-suffering. Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace, your mercy. Thank you that you are a loving, forgiving God, creator of the universe, king of kings, Lord of lords. Lord, you are worthy of all our praise, all our honor. We love you, Lord God. We love you. Ask that you would continue to guide us, continue to reveal your will to us, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we got done early. Does anybody have anything they want to share? A word? Song? Pastor Ben said, if you go short, you'll be a hero. So (laughs) we could have made this like a six-week series, but tried to, you know, cram it into half an hour or so. So God bless you. Have a wonderful day.